Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our ninth episode of Capital Interns. Our podcast essentially helps those high school students, uh, first years, or even second years, to identify the career path that they want. Today's guest is from Carleton University. He studies biochemistry and is currently doing a cancer research position with the university. He has a second degree black belt in martial arts, is the VP of Academics for the Carleton Science Student Society, and the team lead for the Science Student Success Center. He is a very special friend of mine, and he is one of the smartest people I know within the sciences. Really chill and lovable guy. He has so much knowledge on so many things, I can barely even count them. I'd like to introduce my friend Abby Curusetti to the podcast. Hey Abby, what's going on and how are you doing today? How's it going guys? Glad to be here. Thank you for being on the show today with us, Abby. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't expecting to be hyped up like that. My bad. <laughs> now, yeah, now I'm real excited to be here. <laughs> We always hype up our guests. That's why you guys are on there. All the time. You share your stories. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool, cool. You're, you're special. You're special. Hey, man. Feels good. <laughs> on today's episode, we will be discussing Abby's journey in biochemistry at Carleton University, his current cancer research position, and personal challenges and achievements throughout university. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is what motivated you to choose biochemistry at Carleton University, Abby? Um, well, I, I, actually, we could probably split this question into two parts, really. Like, why did I choose biochemistry? And then why did I choose Carleton University, right? Yeah. Um, first off, biochemistry. Um, in high school, actually, I was fluctuating between a lot of different fields that I wanted to go into. Um, business was definitely like on the table. I talk a lot and I figured business would be a good field to go into uh, for that kind of strength. Engineering was another possibility considering both my parents are engineers. What kind of engineers are your parents? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my mom is a telecommunications engineer and then my dad is a systems engineer. Ooh, specialization. Yeah, no, real smart people. Yo, they know the waves. <laughs> oh they really God. do. <laughs> Yeah, no, but then in grade 12, uh, I'm going to drop a name right now. I had uh, biology with Miss Walker and this course, grade 12 biology happens to be a mix of like chemistry, which is one of my strengths, along with human systems and how the chemistry intertwines with that. And I personally found that so interesting and interesting enough for me to actually get into that program. That's super interesting because it's not always the case where your teacher takes such an interest in the student and their, you know, their their growth in high school. So it's kind of cool that you had a, a teacher motivate you that way. Yeah, uh, she really is uh, an awesome teacher. Uh, I think Earl of March was very lucky to have a very good science teaching core there. Oh, wow. Yeah. So all those teachers were able to recommend me to opportunities throughout high school. And yeah, here I am today. Yeah, speaking of, you know, those opportunities that you're talking about, I know one of them in high school, you had an opportunity to be a researcher for McGill University. Can you tell us a bit about it? I think you're hyping that up too. So the same teacher that taught me biology uh, told me about this program. It's called GRFAW or Gene Researcher for a Week. Ooh, fancy. And basically 50 students across Canada are chosen every year to spend a week with a researcher at one of the top institutes in Canada related to like genetic stuff, right? And I was lucky enough to be chosen as one of them. And I spent a week uh, observing and learning from some of the best researchers at McGill. Abby, I was not hyping that up. You were selected among 50 students across Canada to be a part of this program. That is amazing. That's a big achievement. About the program, what was it like? Um, was it what you were expecting or were you surprised with some of the things that you learned? Um, I don't know. To be honest, regarding what I was expecting, I'm not sure I really was expecting anything. I thought it would just be big, amazing. I was, in all honesty, intimidated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Being the high school student that I was and being matched up with like arguably some of the smartest science minds in the country and by extension the world, wow. right? Yeah, it met every expectation that I set, I guess. I was able to witness genetics research firsthand and I was also able to attend uh, presentations by some of the best researchers in the country. That's really cool. What kind of research did you get a chance to see? Can you talk about it or is that private? Yeah. 
one of which we were talking about the main lab that I was affiliated to at McGill was dealing with inborn errors of cobalamin metabolism. Now what let me the break heck? that down. Yes, please. <laughs> please do. Yeah, exactly. So uh, inborn errors refers to any real mutation or error in like the genetic code. Now cobalamin is uh, also known as B12, vitamin B12. Okay. Yeah. Basically, your body needs to process cobalamin in order for it to be used in the proper state in its body. That makes sense, right? Yeah. Similarly to like how I eat food, my cells cannot directly process a hot dog, right? My right. body needs to consume the hot dog and break it down into its fundamental components in order for it to be of use. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So basically, I dealt with cases where some people's like genetic code, unfortunately, was awry. It was wrong when it was dealing with the vitamin B12 metabolism, and that resulted in some pretty devastating diseases. Oh my gosh. Oh wow. What kind of diseases? There was some. I think it was hypercholesterolemia, which is like excess cholesterol in the blood. There was other stuff that I can't even pronounce anymore. I wish I could. And that's associated with more like any biology listeners. It's associated with like the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. Just hearing you talk about it, that is such an amazing opportunity to get in high school. Did you apply for the program or were you referred and then got in? Well, both. I mean, the application process, I did have to apply and I had to talk about other stuff I was affiliated with and how I would use the opportunity and also whether I wanted to go into genetics research, right? These guys didn't want to invest on someone who didn't want to go into that field. Yeah, and I was also referred by Miss Walker, my grade 12 biology teacher. She wrote me obviously a very good recommendation if I got the position. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> so yeah, like definitely Abby, I, I'm really intrigued about the whole application process, but like once you were there, I wanted to know a little bit mo about more of those awesome researchers that you got to witness talks for. What were some of the most amazing researchers you found at this opportunity? Yeah, for sure. On my first day there, I'm totally lost, right? I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. And one of the graduate students was like, hey, uh, you should come and attend this like talk. And I'm like, all right, well, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Sure, I'll absolutely come with you. You know what I mean? Kind of like a mother duck <laughs> guiding like the ducklings. <laughs> right yeah like first so, year of university in frost yeah exactly so basically i followed the graduate student to this talk on something called pro protein convertases would you like me to explain this yes please sure. yeah okay uh i wish there was an image that could go with this unfortunately it is a podcast so i'm going to describe it he's using his earphones again <laughs> i'm using my earphones yeah every time like just for the audience every time abby has to explain something he pulls up his earphones <laughs> yeah. and just de demonstrates an image <laughs> Well, the thing is, the things that I'm explaining are oftentimes genetic based or protein based. And at the fundamental level, uh, DNA or proteins are straight, right? Hence my usage of my earphones, right? So in the case of the pro protein convertases in your body, you have something called insulin. Now, insulin is a protein that is folded up and is released when you have high blood sugar, right? Have I, are you guys still good? Have I still got yeah, you? Yeah, you guys still yeah. got me. Cool. Yeah. So that means when you have like a lot of sugar yeah. in your body? Absolutely. If I eat a bunch, like it's Halloween say, and I eat a bunch of candy, I'm going to have high blood sugar. And therefore my body is then going to secrete insulin in response to that. Now, what insulin does is it binds on the cell surface in order to allow for the sugar to be removed from the bloodstream back to normal levels and increased in the concentration in the cell so that it can be processed and turned into energy. So insulin, as I said, is a folded protein. Now there's a bunch of stuff in the body that helps proteins fold properly. Now I'm going to fold my headphones right now. <laughs> so currently this is insulin right now. This is my headphones folded in half. Now. Unfortunately, this isn't insulin. This is called, I think, pro-insulin. Uh, don't quote me, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it is called pro-insulin. Now, the pro-protein convertase then cuts the ends off this, and that becomes insulin, and then it is now usable. Okay, wow. This is so cool. So, like, now the insulin's, like, ready to use within the human body. Absolutely. Now the insulin's ready to use. Now, I'm, I'm assuming you guys can see if there is high blood sugar and this thing cannot be created, insulin cannot be created, that can cause really bad problems, can it? And that's what this guy was researching. His name is Dr. Nabel Saida, and that's what he was researching. He was re researching errors in pro-protein convertases and the effects that could have on the body. Did you 
happen to go up to him after his talk to like you know learn more or were you too scared and too intimidated <laughs> oh i was absolutely too intimidated it's very hard to come up with like good questions yeah. you know what i mean i'm able to understand this research now because of my biochemistry degree and like my separate reading aside from that uh at the time i had no idea what was going <laughs> on but i was actually lucky enough afterwards to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him oh uh, me and the are not one-on-one -on -one, rather the other grfaws there was two other at mcgill university us three and Dr. Nabel Say that had a sit down. We had some sandwiches and we just chatted with him. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, no. <laughs> I remember you mentioned that uh, once he almost won an award, right, for his research. It is. They're saying that he could be on the short list for a Nobel Prize in the future. Smart guy. He's absolutely brilliant. He's what I hope to be in ideally like 40 years. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I can definitely see that happen. Yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> so I was wondering about your high school experience. If you were going to go back to high school, right? Like right now, what would you change it? Well, as I've been talking right now, like obviously my grade 12 experience was pretty good, right? Yeah. Uh, I was able to find out, figure out what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. Like I, I was able to choose biochemistry. I was able to choose Carleton University and I was able to get experiences beforehand to cement that. I just wish that I was able to get these kinds of experiences earlier on. And to allow for experiences like that to happen earlier on, you need to put yourself out more. And that is something I wish I did uh, in grade nine, grade 10, even grade 11. Yeah, I dealt with pretty bad social anxiety uh, in those grades. And unfortunately that stopped me from really like reaching out and pursuing some stuff that I'm passionate about. And I'm lucky enough to have gotten over that at least enough to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. Would you say that, you know, you got past the social anxiety in grade 12? What sort of things helped you, you know, go get past that? I wish there was like, that moment do you know what i mean like it's not like a lightning like struck like 10 feet over from me and i was suddenly like aha i know exactly what i want to do no it's it's never that glamorous you know what probably happened I, I i can't even tell you a day i just had the epiphany i was like i want to know what i want to do and therefore i really started researching i started reading more and then yeah lo, lo and behold i found something that i'm interested in with biochemistry what was your research process like to finally figure out that biochemistry was what you wanted to do? I think keeping an open mind. Uh, as I said, I mean, obviously my mind was open enough to consider business, engineering, and somehow a science career. Everything, basically. Yeah, literally everything, right? It, how do I say this? It basically took that class. Like, I cannot stress mm -hmm. that class enough. That class, me reading outside of class, and that experience, and that was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah, makes sense. What about you, Rafid? Was uh, computer class that one class that made you decide on software at Carlton? Well, this might be a little bit of spoiler for the end of the season, but I had no <laughs> idea what I was doing at the time. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I had zero idea what I was doing. I was I was so like set on going to chemical engineering. Really? I was so set on that. Yes. Oh, cool. I was so set on it. Yes. 100%. My mind is blown. I did not know yeah. this. Yeah. I was good. I was going to go to chemical engineering and then later on I was like, yeah, I don't like organic chemistry. <laughs> like great job organic chemistry. I hate it. I couldn't do it. I was oh, like, really? yeah, this is not my oh, thing. I absolutely this is definitely loved. Not my thing. Absolutely I know loved you did. I know you did. We had this conversation. We had this conversation in grade 12. I remember this. Like I, I didn't I didn't understand like half of what was going on. So that's why I didn't really, like really like enjoy or like it. I like the physical oh, yeah. chemistry more, like in my opinion, at least. Yeah, like like thermal chemistry. Thermal oh, chemistry. oh okay, I see. Fair, yeah, yeah, everyone loves thermal like, chemistry. To be fair, <laughs> and, yeah. and entropy and entropy. Yeah, yeah like that was my that, that was that was my stuff. I like. I a lot. was more I was more into organic chemistry actually more than the thermal stuff. Oh. So why not chemical engineering, Dorina? Because uh, <laughs> I was more into math and literature and computers back then i had to make my choice like how we're feeding saying he wanted he was thinking of chemical engineering i was thinking of becoming a french and a math teacher like i remember distinctly emailing the university of ottawa asking them do you guys have a double major program where i can do french and math together <laughs> <laughs> Now that I look back, I feel so stupid. Man, that's actually so funny that you bring that up. Uh, I also wanted to be a science teacher <laughs> at one point. Yeah. yeah. You could uh, still be one. 
I, I can see you as a prop. I can see you as yeah. a prop. Yeah, well, you teach really well. Explaining yeah. concepts so easily, yeah. Well, yeah, no, like, because uh, every single job I've held has some sort of teaching component with it. Like, I've been a karate instructor. Yeah. Right? I think the audience knows after you gas me up <laughs> with the <laughs> second degree black belt. Oh, we'll, we'll get to that part. We'll get to that part. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was able to teach a lot of stuff that I've learned, so I'm lucky. And you're a TA, too, for, um, for a couple courses, right? No, I oh, wish. Okay. I just didn't have the time. Oh yeah, 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 cause, cause I, cause I thought you were gonna TA chemistry for engineers, uh, like, cause I, cause I remember we were talking about this a while back. Oh really? Um, I actually was planning on TAing a third year biochemistry course for the upcoming year, but then it's a lab only course, and oh no, it's a lab only <laughs> course, and also I'm just I'm committed to just too many other things, unfortunately. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Imagine Abby has the first year chem TA. We would, chemistry would have made a lot more sense. Yo. <laughs> Someone could do the labs properly, at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, no, I guess I guess that opportunity won't happen at Carleton. Uh, hopefully I'm graduating by the end of this year, so. Right. How many years has it been uh, at Carleton so far? So this is my fourth year. So this is my fourth and hopefully final year. Yeah. yeah. Damn, Abby, you're graduating before me. <laughs> Feels bad. Well, oh yeah, fair. you guys uh, started together, right? Yeah. 20, 20, 2017? 2017, yeah. Uh, yeah. To be fair to you guys though, you guys have co-ops, right? Uh, engineering, it, it makes more sense for engineers to have co-ops because right after your undergraduate, you can enter the workforce like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, biochemistry really isn't that kind of degree. Unfortunately, if with the BSc, I would need an MSc, so a master's degree, and potentially even a PhD if I want to get into a research position, right? Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be a long road. <laughs> a long road. Yeah. He took the high road. <laughs> well, that's debatable. I took the long road, but at least I enjoy it, so... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, honestly, I'd rather do something I enjoy for the next 30 years of my life than, you know, do something that's easy. And the next 30 years of my life, I just like miserable. Like, I, I, I wouldn't want an easy road what, that makes me miserable rather than I'd rather have like a hard road that makes me happy. Right. Well, even more so, it's oftentimes the stuff that you enjoy comes to you easier. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I'm sure you guys would understand that maybe with some of your engineering courses that kind of just click, you know what I mean? Yep. That's yeah. True. Like in high school, that was me with chemistry. Even now that's me with most biochem and science courses. So yeah, it just shows you I'm in the right environment. That's all. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, when going, going into like more so in depth about university, how was the first year of your university like? And what were some of the challenges that, you know, you went through? Yeah, absolutely. So going to Carleton Biochemistry, uh, many of my friends didn't go there. Uh, a lot of my friends went to Ottawa U. A lot of my friends went to Waterloo, uh, Queens. Like the, it was all over the place, you know? And I was the only person in si like biochemistry at Carleton or even any related life science program. So basically whatever safe community of friends that I had exiting high school was no longer there. And I basically had to start from scratch. And unfortunately, first year was a bit lonely because I had to restart building all these connections. So yeah, I, that was definitely a struggle for sure. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have like good time. To, like we only had that one semester where we actually had that same break. I think <laughs> I think it was it was first or second semester. Yeah, you remember that in that fourth, fourth uh, of course. Of library. Uh, a lot of times, uh, a lot of people I ran into from high school who just didn't go to Carleton, I ran into on the bus. <laughs> on the way yeah. to school or on the, the way to, home to canada yeah. yeah yeah i can imagine it's all the same people <laughs> yeah for real yeah because yeah, it's all the canada people so yeah you always run into those guys 61 gang yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the courses that you take in biochemistry and do you get like a lot of electives <laughs> no. Um, so I get four electives for all four of my years. And then the remainder of which includes, I have to take a couple of physics classes, a bunch of bio, a bunch of biochemistry, obviously, and then some research oriented courses as well. Research oriented courses? Yeah, I love that you're bringing that up. So I've, we've already talked about this of how like I sort of got exposed to research back in high school. Yeah. But my first time, like not just being like a passive observer, but like actively trying to think of projects and troubleshoot was 
I'd say August 2018, so right after first year and just at the beginning of second year. I took a course, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna shout this out for any Carleton biochemistry people who are listening. Um, it's called BIOC, so B-I-O-C 2400, and it's an independent research course. So basically you find a supervisor on campus who runs a lab and they will take you in, help you come up with a project to work on, and then you could just build your skills through that. That's kind of cool. Who did you pick as your prop? Yeah, I chose uh, Dr. Kyle Bigger. Uh, he has a functional proteomics lab. So basically he deals with like enzymatics, like enzyme stuff. Yeah, and it's a uh, role in potentially cancers. Oh, I see. Yeah, I got affiliated with that out of second year and I'm still in that lab now in fourth. I, I know I can't understand where it all started. Yeah, man. Who's, who's the best prof you've ever had in your program? The best prof? Oh my God. I wish there was a best prof. Like, I honestly think that there are multiple, including my own supervisor, right? If we're gonna ask me best teachers, I would say my- Yeah, you know what? That is a good point. There's a difference between a good teacher and like a professor. Yeah, So I like how you brought that up. Who was the best teacher you had in university? I'm gonna say two names. Uh, The first of which is my supervisor for the lab. Uh, Dr. Kyle Baker. And the second of which is my mentor in the lab. He's a postdoc. His name is Dr. Hemanta Adhikari. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, uh, he his job was basically to take me under his wing and teach me like all these like skills related to like proteomics and stuff, basic lab work. And yeah, no, he was an awesome teacher. Yo, man. Yeah. No, oh, that's right. Did you have other courses with those people other than the research one? No, I wish. I was directly affiliated with like Kyle through the lab. So I guess that course, the 2400 course, the independent research one was with Kyle and Hemanta. But other than that, I only now have a course with Kyle in fourth year. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. What's it called? It's called uh, Biophysical Techniques. Um, it's related to like stuff that I learned in the labs, right? Basically, some of the experiments I have to run well, like some of the exper- like some of the ideas that I've come up with, you can do specific techniques in order to try to figure out whether the hypothesis I've come up with is correct, right? Now, in this course, you're able to learn many different techniques to try to find out multiple different things, right? In a biology lab, and that's what this course is. Nice. Yeah. So you you know, as we were talking about Carlton and Canada, your your commute is probably like an hour or maybe. An hour and 30 with traffic? How'd you find the commute from school to uni? (laughs) Oh man, Um, so with the O train, um, if I time it in the mornings, I'm able to take one express bus. No, sorry, that used to, I'm so sorry. That used to get me to Bayview Station and then I could take the O train to Carlton, right? right? If it's an off hour, I have to take two buses (laughs) and then a train. And nowadays, um, because of the LRT, I have to take two buses and two trains to get to Carlton. (laughs) That doesn't sound any easier. No, no, it's actually harder, believe it or not. (laughs) It's it's more of a hassle because, okay, at Tunnies, you see all these people. And then if there's too many people at like the peak hours, right? You you have to wait for the next train. And when you wait for the next train, then the O train probably already left at at that time. You have to wait the O train. You have to wait for the next train. Yeah, that's especially tough in the winters, I found because then you're just freezing and you're like, yeah, come faster, please. But no, the commutes weren't that bad in the sense that they were long enough that if I did have to get something done, I could do that on my laptop. I could sleep if I wanted to, which for any high school students listening, it is a very good skill to learn how to sleep on a moving bus. (laughs) Yeah, I would say. (laughs) That's the the only thing I literally, the only thing I do on the bus is either sleep or listen to music. Exactly, yeah. And that's what I did for a while. I wish I could sleep. I wish I could power sleep. Yeah, no, it's a skill. I can't, I can't power sleep on the bus, no. Like, I have to be really tired if I need to power sleep on the bus, but I've, I can't. Because honestly, I always have to see like what's going on because like, you, you, don't, you don't know what, what yeah, people are doing on the bus. True. Like, there's some random stuff that sometimes that's, happens. That's oh, oh my god. <laughs> I don't think it's that that sketchy, thankfully. All right. So, do you have any tips on how to make friends in university? Yeah. Uh, this is kind of like cliche advice. Almost everyone says this, but there's a reason why everyone says this. 
uh, get involved. Um, it's something that I wish I had done in high school earlier, and it's something that I recommend you do in university. So in my case, I really didn't know a lot of people at Carleton, and I wasn't really involved in first year. Uh, with my second year, I got involved with the Science Student Success Center. It's the center on campus where you're able to mentor undergraduates in science on any of their issues. And that could be either academic wise or personal wise. And there's a very strong community among the mentors there. So I was able to build a community through that. I eventually joined the Chemistry and Biochemistry Society on campus. And I was subsequently able to become an executive for that. And yeah, I also joined like the science, the science society on campus. And now I'm also an executive for that as well. Mr. Exec. You know, we, I was actually going to ask about that. Um, your extracurriculars that you did while you were in, univers in university, were you nervous when you first started out? Or did you find it easy to just go to the club and start talking to people and joining it? Was I nervous in joining these things? Um, I feel like stuff like confidence can vary <laughs> depending on the moment. I don't know if you guys get this too. That's true. Right? No, I agree. Yeah, like sometimes yeah. I'm like, oh my god, I, I can't talk to anyone. But sometimes I'm like, I'm really feeling this. I'm gonna go chat with as many people as possible. And yeah, maybe I was lucky enough to time that. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, of course, I think it's normal to be nervous. It means you care. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. That does mean you care. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, honestly, whenever, like, whenever I see Abby, like, anywhere, like, it's so easy to just go up to him and just, and just start talking to him because he's just yeah. that, like, approachable to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> how was the, how were those uh, extracurricular experiences? Like, what did you learn out of it? I think, actually, this is another tip regarding this. I think the most powerful thing regarding choosing extracurriculars that you join is choose stuff that like you want to do. A huge issue with a lot of aspiring uh, professionals is that they want to put stuff on their resume. Good right? point. And even I, like I used to sometimes do this too. I'm sure I still do. Yeah. Um, where sometimes- I did too. Right, yeah. you join something just for the sake of putting it on your resume. And I mean, if that's your goal, like sure. Like if that's your goal, you've met your goal. But your goal, in my opinion, should be so much more than that, right? Mm -hmm. Like you should be able, like you should want to gain something out of it or you should want to help the community in some sense. And that's kind of why I joined actually these societies. I had some intention with whatever uh, the society was affiliated with or whatever the club was affiliated with. And then I tried to meet that. What was the impact on your growth from, you know, being a lead in the, the Student Success Center? The Science Student Success Center, yeah. Being a mentor was actually really powerful there in the sense that I was able to have a direct hand in helping uh, students through their academic issues or their personal issues and help them set them back on track. That's incredibly yeah, powerful. That's true. Right? Because then you can literally say that, hey, like I have helped this person, like you've saved this person, literally, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And that's such a powerful thing to say, you know? So that's why there's a lot of satisfaction from that. And then being a team lead there, uh, I have, I run the career team there. So we're responsible for workshops associated with getting into like your profession after your undergrad or just surviving your academics at university. Those are powerful in itself in the sense that the workshops are very important, but I'm also able to teach my team uh, how to chat with students and how to better them. Yeah. You know? So in a way you have more of an effect. That's true. Right? It's in Herzberg, right? The center, third floor. Absolutely, yeah. Third floor Herzberg. I discovered that place because uh, you know the area in front, how they have like big windows. It gives off on on the canal, right? Absolutely gorgeous. I discovered that by accident, and I sat down, and I didn't know that at the back there was actually the science center right behind me. <laughs> but yeah, that was a really cool place. There's a bunch of stuff that I imagine that you guys would go to as well. There's actually the math tutorial center just around the corner. Bunch of stuff. Herzberg is a physics and math building. And oh, yeah, building, for sure. So. Yeah, it is a concept building. There's something even cooler in Herzberg. Actually, there is uh, the sci the Computer Science Society like lounge. I think that's fourth floor Herzberg and mm. love yeah. it. Like they have such a nice community there. It's something that I was hoping for like the Biochem Society. Mm -hmm. So no, I love it. It's like similar to our IEEE Arena. Really? Like, their office, yeah. Yeah, there's like a small arcade there as well, I think. Yeah, there is. It's just, nice. it's just awesome. Yeah, I really like, I sometimes I wish I was in Compside just to go in there. But, then, <laughs> but <laughs> you can still go, right? Do you have to be in Compside to be part of that society? No, you don't. I don't think so. I'm not, I'm yeah, not yeah, sure. I don't think so. Uh, maybe I was too intimidated. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So going on to your program, right? Yeah. I know from friends from you, Ottawa, that biochem is a very tough program.、Uh, in your perception, is it? And what study tips can you give to students who are, you know, currently studying in the fall or will be studying next year? Well, first study tip for biochem:、uh, straight up, if you don't like, do biochem because you like biochem. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of people in my program, or at least they were in my program. Uh, who had to drop out because they did it for the sole purpose of like med school stuff, and like that's fine. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, obviously you have a goal, but don't do a program that you're not interested in because biochem is too tough for that. Straight up, if you're interested enough in the content, you can breeze by it. Is my opinion.、Uh, with that being said, study tips: ah,、uh, stay on top of your stuff. The moment that you get an assignment, like do as much of it as you can. Yeah. No, that's a really like good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Don't leave it last minute. Don't procrastinate. Yeah, Abby, I, I have a question actually about that.、Um, how long do you usually spend、um, time in your lab? Usually, like my lab reports. Yeah, I would argue that like I'm gonna contrast this with like studying for class.、Um, I would argue that like maybe ninety percent of my time is lab reports, right? And then probably ten percent of the time would be just studying for like a subject. You know, biochemistry. Like think of the jobs that you get from biochemistry, right? They're all lab based. They're all laboratory research based,、mm -hmm. or at least a majority of them are. So it makes sense that there are a bunch of labs that you have to do with your program, and that also results in a boatload of lab reports.、Mm -hmm. So yeah. Are they hard? Did you find them hard when you first started doing lab reports? Uh, a general, I'm gonna say no.、Uh, they weren't hard per se. Some courses, if you don't understand the lab, it is a hard lab report. Do you know what I mean? Yeah,、oh, I see. Right, like a lot of lab reports, the whole purpose is to explain the lab and explain like what you're doing, why I did the lab, right? Why I did this experiment、yeah. and your results and your results,、mm -hmm. right? You have to process your data and. If you don't know what the lab's about, then the lab report becomes very difficult,、mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So I I definitely say that there were a couple lab reports over the years where I'm just like, wow, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> How do you break it down? How do you break the process of you know writing your lab reports down? Because I know like some students might be stuck or stumped for somewhere. I'm usually stumped when I when I remember doing chemistry labs. I used to be stumped on the hypothesis section, but I know、um, later on. Uh, for sciences, this lab report has become more than just a hypothesis. Yeah, of course. So I always enjoy data crunching, like data processing. Like I do an experiment, I get my numbers, and then I process that. Now I've always enjoyed doing that because it's really cool, like quantitatively or qualitatively, seeing、mm -hmm. a microscopic process at work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I can't see what's going on there, but somehow this experiment has shown me what I thought would happen if there was that microscopic process, which is mind blowing to me. So, in my opinion, just like I process data first,、uh, that's the first thing I do, and then I write about what I've seen. Like, okay, there's an upward trend here. That's a result of this phenomenon. Now, how does that phenomenon tie in with that upward trend? You guys are engineers. You guys are logicians in that sense, right? You guys deal with flow charts. You guys are very analytical, right? Literally, that's how you write lab reports. You see your data, and now you need to explain why that data came about and why I did the experiment to determine that data. I see. That that's that's a really good way to like you know start off like you know writing your analysis or like even like starting to think of the hypothesis for the lab. I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of students will take a, a lot of good advice from this because、yeah. I remember like I can I like when I started a lab, I just wanted to get my results. And then if I don't get the results I had, right, I'd be like, yo, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the observations, right? Yeah, you change the values. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm gonna give some advice to the podcast viewer and、uh, listeners. <laughs> Never change your data. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Never do that. Oops, guys. Don't listen to what Rafid said at yeah, all. Don't do it. <laughs> Always take your data at face value because sometimes you might. Reveal something that you would not have expected, and I think that's the best part about science, right? You can go in with a hypothesis, right? You can go in with something like you think it's going to happen this way, and it happens a different way, and that opens that opens up yeah, so many more、I、questions、see. that allow you to just think about so much more. It's very beautiful if you think about it like that. 
I should have thought, I thought about it like that, mm. rather than like, I need to get this result. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, no, again, same same thing, like in chemistry um, first year. Like the way you just trap the process, if I had thought about it like that back in first year, I think my lab reports and my results would have made a lot more sense to me, because then I would have thought about why I was getting re these results and whatnot. But back then it was just about okay yeah. the value should be around there yeah. did i get it around there is it correct <laughs> well straight up guys like the biggest thing about school is what you take away from it like they what school is trying to do is just toss a bunch of information at you right mm -hmm. that they believe will benefit you in some way now what you can do is either you can memorize that and put that on a test or you can take that process it understand it and then apply it to everything right mm. and i think arguably that's the best way that's the best usage of all this information right that's true so yeah that's how you should approach lab reports uh straight up that's how you should approach anything learning based in my opinion yeah yep all right guess what time it is abby oh, don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> it's game time rapid fire round time oh man all right let's hear it what do you got for me so here's how it's gonna work okay you have five seconds to answer each question I have five seconds to answer each question. Yeah, and we'll time you. Yeah. Yo, what kind of stress is this? My God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's hear it. What's your favorite book and how did it impact your life? Yeah, five seconds. My God. Uh, the Gene and Intimate Story. It's written by Sadada Mukherjee. Okay. How did it impact your life? Oh, you guys are giving me more time. Oh. Yeah, we want to know. Uh, we, we, want, we want you to at least come up with an answer within uh, five seconds, right? Yeah, no, uh, let me just say it again. Uh, the book that I read and so that I'm not panicking while I'm saying it. <laughs> the book itself is called The Gene. Uh, it's called The Gene and Intimate History. I'm sorry. Okay. And it's by uh, uh, Sadada Mukherjee. That book, that book is amazing. Uh, I read that book uh, in grade 12. It was a part of my like whole decision to choose biochemistry. Dr. Sadada Mukherjee, he is a biologist. He's absolutely brilliant. He's another person, he's another role model of mine. Someone I would like to be like someday. And he's also a very good writer. And that book got me interested in genetics because uh, it gave me the full history of that. But it was such a captivating, the, uh, such a captivating novel or sorry, book that it also taught me how to write better. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. So no, uh, amazing book. He also won a Pulitzer Prize for another book he wrote. Cool. Yeah, crazy guy. All right, next question. What was your favorite part of growing up? Uh, I'm gonna say gym class. <laughs> gym class. What was your favorite okay. part of gym class? I wish. Every day is leg day. <laughs> Man, I wish there was a better answer. I absolutely adored like sports growing up. Uh, I was a very active kid. I played a lot of sports and stuff. And yeah. What'd you gym... play? Uh, I used to play baseball. Uh, competitively. Uh, I also, I never competed with swimming, but I used to lifeguard. swim. I'm a lifeguard, yeah. right? So I swim. And then I also used to do karate, like martial arts and then fighting associated mm -hmm. with it. It was so cool. Yeah. So Abby, what's your favorite spot on campus? Spot on campus? There's a uh, second floor Stacy is a good one. Really? Yeah. Not what I was, I was yeah, expecting like, Hersberg or something. Oh, Stacy's the lab building, isn't it? It's the lab building, yeah. But it's not, honestly, actually now thinking about it, I would say second floor Stacy's one of them and then Nesbitt. What is what Nesbitt? What the heck is Nesbitt? Oh, you guys don't know Nesbitt. Yeah, Nesbitt's the biology building. Is that the new building? No, it's not new at all. It's actually really There's old. a biology <laughs> building? We have a biology building. It's, uh, do you guys know where Robertson Hall is? Yeah. It's across the street from Robertson Hall. Oh, I see. Do you guys know what the butterfly show is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. That's Nesbitt. <gasps> okay. Oh, so it's right next to the, um, it's right next to the co-op office. Then, right? Yeah, next to the CTTC, exactly. The reason I like the second floor of Stacy is that there's this computer lab right there that not many people know about. And I usually do a lot of my studying there, a lot of my chilling there uh, with some friends of mine in my program. Unfortunately, not anymore because oh, of because of this pandemic. But then Nesbit, I always adored Nesbit because there's greenhouses there. It just smells like biology. This is yeah. such a cool study spot. I would have loved it if I knew about it, but too late for me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's too bad. No, it's a beautiful place. I love that place. It's always so nice to hear about other people's experiences on campus, especially about like buildings and stuff. Yeah, yeah. hidden spots. Always hidden spots, yeah. I imagine that's not so hidden for like the biology and biochemistry majors, but like everyone else, like no many people know Nesbitt exists. Now they know. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have said it. Now they know. Yo, sometimes that's what I do. Sometimes I keep my study spots private because I don't want people going there. Yeah. 
Should have kept it secret. <laughs> ah, well, it's fine. Y'all can join me. What's your favorite one, Dorina? In uh, so last semester, my favorite spot was that bridge between architecture and Mackenzie, where you get to sit on the heater, and I would sit there and study because it was so warm. That was my favorite spot. You like anywhere that's hot? Because I, I I don't really like winter. I'm more of a summer person, and I always like 30 degree weather. So I always look Jesus for those Christ. warm spots. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Abby, there was a heat wave the other day. And she's like, she messaged me. She's like, this is the this is the best day of my life. And I'm oh like, God. I'm dying over here from the heat. Yeah, it's actually so funny that you bring that up, Darina. Because if you really want like a hot, like a really hot place to study, the fourth floor of Stacy is absolutely scorching. Oh, wow. Like I'm always sweating when I'm up there that for a lab. Beautiful. Yeah, if you want to go there, I hate being there, but obviously that seems to fit with your interests. Yeah, no, do it. What about you, Rafi? What's your favorite spot? Okay, originally, my favorite spot, like, at the time before it became crowded and became, like, I guess just crowded central was 4th Floor Discovery Center. Oh, that was my sense. original favorite spot. But then afterwards, like, later on, it just gets so crowded and people don't go there to study at all or, like, you know, just to chill. People are wild <laughs> there. So then... Instead, I went. Uh, I went to architecture um, first floor. Like there's uh, the red room, right? Yes, the red room. I love the, yeah, red, the red room. room nice. Not a lot of people know about it, but yeah, it's so nice there. I've never heard of that. Yeah. Abby, it's literally, it's literally like if you go to architecture, go to first floor, and then if you walk out towards um, UC on first floor, it's on the way. You'll miss it because, like, I think it's like glass, but it's like blurred, so you don't see yeah. the inside of it. But when the doors open, you see that it's like this beautiful red room that looks like an actual like fancy library. Um, that rich person yeah. owns. One of those, yeah, like one of those antique libraries with like like binded leather cover books, and it has its comfy couches, wow. this wooden table, and it's so nice to study. Yeah, in. that sounds like a legitimate like hidden like beauty, like a hidden spot. Yeah. But Darina, my fa- my favorite one when I want to go to help is Elsa Miguel Learning Center, like in first year. I love I love that. True. True. Next question. If the world was ending, what's the first thing you take with you? Oh my god. What would I take with me? Oh no. Time's Your time is up. Man, that's a, that's a... What would I take with me? How is it ending? A meteor is crashing. Oh, oh, that sounds like I'm just gonna die. Um, okay, I thought it was like, just like the end of like society. No, it's like the end of like everyone. What would I take with me? My God, I don't think I'd take anything with me. I'd take myself with me. <laughs> Straight up. I mean, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna die, I mean, ideally, I'd like to be surrounded by like my friends and stuff, right? So I can just like joke until the end. But <laughs> otherwise, yeah, nothing. There's nothing that I'd like specifically want to be holding when I die. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, really? No, no. You don't have that one object that you're like, yo, this is the object. That if someone takes away from your rips, like the like I will kill them. If it's like a force field or something, if it's like some like crazy like shield that'll like protect me, then yeah, I'll take that. If that exists. Oh but like if I'm if I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. Uh so be it. Uh I think I'll just wait it out. Alright, Abby. Oh my god, this question. This is a question five. you've been waiting for. What is your favorite YouTube channel? Oh, I absolutely love this question. I'm going to give a huge shout out to an Alec IU. He has this gaming channel called AX3 Gaming. Y'all should check it out. It's got good gaming content. Uh, he's currently doing a Last of Us series. That is my favorite gaming. That is my favorite YouTube channel, period. What kind of gaming? Like, what kind of game? Uh, currently, he's doing a Last of Us Part 2 series. Last of Us is... It's a very... It's a. It's sort of like a zombie game, but it is... Mm-hmm. It has a lot of depth when it comes to the story. So he's playing that. It sounds like Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah. it's like Walking Dead. It's a good story affiliated with just, like, zombies. You know, so that, yeah, no, uh, he does that. And he also does an Uncharted, uh, which is another good game series. He's currently doing Marvel Avengers. That's what he's doing right now. Oh, cool. Yo. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. So check it out. Man, if he did Nintendo, I would definitely watch him. Kidding, <laughs> kidding. I love Alex's videos. I see, I, I see them from time to time. They're very good. Good quality too. Yeah, absolutely. They're really good quality. They're, actually, yeah, they're legitimately good videos. So y'all should check them out. Yeah. So what are your favorite video games, Abby? My favorite video games? Uh, I'm a science kid. I love science fiction, so I would probably put Halo up there. I absolutely adored Halo growing up, and that is, that's it. That's what I'm putting down as, like, that entire series. Next question. What was the most memorable thing someone has ever said to you? Yeah, okay. Um, My supervisor, uh, Dr. Kyle Bigger, 
Uh, this is the only thing that I can like think of right now because this really stuck with me. He told me two things. The first of which is, hey, Abby, like I legitimately think that you could be a prolific researcher one day is what he told me. And so when someone that is your role model, someone that you want to be says something like that to you, it really sticks with you. So that was one of them. And then another one that he said is you always got to work smarter, not harder. Yeah. 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 I tell that to everyone now because that's how you got to do it, right? Like you could work as hard as you want, but at the end of the day, if it isn't directed work or efficient work, it isn't going to really get you anywhere, right? So work smarter, yep, for not sure. harder. Mm -hmm. Next question. Have you saved someone from drowning as a lifeguard? When did it happen? <laughs> um not officially i would probably say one of my class uh one of the kids kicked each other oh uh in my class we were all treading water in the deep end and one of the other kids kicked another kid by accident obviously by accident <laughs> i i think i think so i don't know i'm gonna say it was by accident because i like that kid <laughs> and uh the other boy like he went under like he started he was like oh no he started panicking and he went under so i had to i like picked him up and then i put him on the yeah. side of the pool Yo, Abby, I, I can't imagine lifeguarding though, because like, you have to be so good at swimming. You gotta like swim there, you gotta pick them up. You gotta make sure that like, you need a lot of muscle for that. That has big games. <laughs> I don't think you need a lot of muscle per se. You just gotta know how to swim, right? Um, most of the like lifeguards at least have been swimming for like, at least like five years, six years, right? At least, if not their entire life. Like I've been swimming since my pretty much my entire life. Yeah. So, yeah. My last question I want to ask is, um, a follow-up to that like how hard is is it to become a lifeguard because i've always heard like brutal trains and brutal like hours going into it i think the word brutal is wrong i i don't think it's like i mean obviously they're not impossible there's so many lifeguards that work for the city of ottawa at, at the very least you definitely need to be a a decent swimmer obviously not olympic level not even competition level but you need to be able to meet good swimming requirements and you have to be able to tread holding a weight so you have to be a strong swimmer for sure yeah i see i see yeah, yeah. that was my last question that was uh all the questions we had for the game obviously you did very well i think you only missed one of them i did miss one of them <laughs> oh maybe next time thank you for playing it was super fun yeah yeah you're welcome of course always happy to play all right back to some serious questions Something we think is super cool about you is that you have a second degree black belt in martial arts <laughs> and you even used yeah. to compete in the national level and you've also been an instructor for it. Tell us about your martial arts journey. How did it first start? Yeah, for sure. It started early. I would say I started karate, which is a martial art, uh, when I was five. Basically, uh, I, uh, I was a very small kid. Right. And as a result, it resulted in me being picked on when I was in grade one. And my parents' solution to that was like, hey, well, let's go teach this kid how to defend himself. And that's what they did. They signed me up for that. And yeah, that's where it started. I started off with a martial art, which is unfortunately just a bunch of like forms and stuff where you're like punching invisible targets. Abby is karate kid. Yeah, yeah no, the unfortunate thing for my parents about this <laughs> is that uh, I wasn't I wasn't the best at like punching invisible targets. I was a better like actual fighter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see. So it ended up going down that pathway more yeah. than it. Is that how you got into uh, competitions for like national level and stuff? Well, I competed at like the regional level, like I competed in Montreal and there were some like national level tournaments that I competed in there. I also competed in Kingston uh, quite a bit as well. Um, yeah, no, I competed in both like the art stuff of it and then the fighting stuff of it. But the thing is, I was way better at the fighting stuff of it. So I earned a lot more trophies from the fighting part than the form nice. part. Nice. How long was your martial arts journey like in total? Yeah, oh man, it... 2005 is when I was five. Damn. So it That's continued. Yeah, I, I haven't. I, I kind of stopped doing it because I was really. I'm really busy right now. I would say it's not finished. So at least 15 years. And how many years of teaching? Uh, so I got my black belt in 2010. So uh, eight years of like formal teaching, and then I've been taking a break for like two years to focus on other stuff. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, what were some of the experiences you were exposed to when you did become a black belt? What were some of the experiences I was exposed to? Hmm. I guess um, as a black belt, it opens up the world to so much more than just karate. Um, up until that point, you learn like katas, they're called, which is like art form where you're like, you're punching an invisible mm -hmm. opponent, you're fighting them. Uh, there's also bow forms, 
like bow katas, where uh, you use a bow staff and you do the same thing. And then there was point fighting, where I basically, I'm padded up and I'm trying to punch someone, right? Um, yeah, that's, those were the three that I was exposed to. Once it became a black belt, I was then exposed to like kickboxing. I was exposed to grappling. I was exposed Whoa. to so much more. <laughs> that's, uh, that sounds very physical. <laughs> I was, yeah, no, it, the, it got so much arguably better because then it was exposed more so to like the application of it as opposed to just the performance side of it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. So I'm actually just wondering, because I know that like when I watched Karate Kid, the movie, <laughs> one of the values that they teach is respect. What were some of the valuable skills and lessons you learned from martial arts? Yeah, absolutely. Public speaking, for sure. That's a surprising one. How, how's that? Well, a lot of people wouldn't think that public speaking would be a necessary skill that you'd learn within martial arts because it's like, you know, all physical. You respect, you bow, and then afterwards you, you know, you guys do your tussle and everything. And then good game at the end. So that's why <laughs> that's why I always thought, right? And that's that's what we no, that's I mean, what like the audience usually thinks. But it's yeah. kind of surprising hearing from like an actual actual like you know black belt that there's a lot of public speaking mm -hmm. that goes into it. I think also with teaching, right? Well, that's what it is exactly. Like um, as a black belt, you're required to assist classes or even lead classes. Now, in order to do that, you need to be able to be a decent public speaker. Classes can be big. Classes can be like 30, 40 people. Wow. Now, as a as when you're 10 years old, it's intimidating, right? That is scary as a 10 year old teaching a class. Yeah, it's actually arguably even scarier because it's not people that are younger than you. It's usually, it's oftentimes adults, you know? It's, ad it's people of all ages. So you somehow need to come across in such a manner where people who are four times, five times older than you are still able to respect you and listen to you and listen to your guidance. And that's something that I developed through that. What was it like, you know, going to that first class where you had to teach? <laughs> How was it like? What was it like? Uh, I was lucky enough that my first class I taught was a kid's class. So these guys were three to five years old, uh, super cute. So <laughs> yeah, not much stress there. Uh, the public speaking isn't as important there, but it's a good way to start on the path, right? Also, karate also taught me like how to be a role model you know people are looking up to you in that sense so you need to behave a certain way and be able to be a teacher to all your peers if that's needed you know what i mean yeah mm -hmm. i was already doing that as a brown belt and even before that so by the time i was a black belt i just had to say it louder what i was doing since for the past year pretty much Very true. it teaches you discipline right yes <laughs> um a lot of discipline was developed from the training we, they made us do a lot of just exercise and a lot of stuff just to like build character yeah. i guess For sure. um wow. there was one thing that i did one thing that i did uh there's something called leg raises yeah uh you put your hands underneath your, your butt and then you legs up legs down uh you never put your legs on the floor though you always got to hold those out and sometimes one of the senseis would come around and just stand on you like on your abs while you're doing that yeah and Obviously, if you're doing the leg raises right, your abs should be mm -hmm. flexed, which means that it shouldn't hurt at all. Uh, obviously, someone standing on you <laughs> is makes it tougher. <laughs> so stuff like that builds yeah. discipline. It gives you a drive. Holy, yeah. I'm already thinking about it. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Yo, Abby, I actually have a question on top That's of it. the discipline topic. Um, so my question was more so about... Um, have you ever had a moment where someone doesn't take you seriously like within one of your karate classes oh well, yeah i mean it's inevitable is it not uh i imagine this is the case for most teachers as well where majority of kids might respect your authority and some of the kids simply don't you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah how inevitable. do you handle that honestly a good question a lot of times uh i mean you'd have to just set them on like a punishment first off you tell them like hey like stop stop doing this uh, I will, let's refocus up, you know what I mean? Let's participate in this class. Otherwise I'm gonna send you and make you do like a punishment of some sort, right? Um, if that doesn't work after the warnings don't work, uh, you basically just make them do like push-ups on the side. Like, hey. Whoa, damn. Yo, yeah, yo, yo, yo. What's, what's, yo give, give an impression. Like what's, what's Abby's persona? Oh my goodness. Uh, let me just, uh, let's see if I can channel it right now. Like, I don't know, like, uh, the, he's not paying attention. So like, hey, buddy, you got to listen in class. Uh, you are not focusing. You're disrupting the class. I need you to focus up. Otherwise, I'm going to send you to the side. Okay. And we're going to be doing push-ups until I forget. <laughs> you know? Oh, my God. I never expected that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, in some cases, if they, if they are disrupting the class, you're taken away from everyone else's learning. Right? Yeah. 
Um, if it does push a point where he is like he or she is legitimately disrupting the class, like it, I cannot continue the class with them, then you let them know. You're like, hey, like go to the side. Yeah, honestly, I think one of the things I took from last year um, when I was、uh, the lead for an event, I never actually had to deal with conflict of resolution per se because I would I would always be like you know either be second in command or you know.、Right. In positions where where I'm where I'm just like helping out the team and doing the best I can, but when you're in like that top like you know in teacher or instructor or leadership position, right? Yeah. People are people are looking for you for guidance, and when people don't listen, you have to know how to give it to them straight. And I and I had so much of that struggle like for so long because I always felt like if I if I'm too harsh, then、um, some people might not appreciate that and feel like I'm being like an or something like that, right? So I don't know if you usually have like that kind of、um, like consensus. When... Well, I would argue that like you can't use a lot of what the techniques that I use for discipline in the class for karate in the real world.、Mm-hmm. For example, if someone is bothering me and not listening to me on like at the <laughs> science success center, I can't be like, "Hey, man, I'm gonna make you do push-ups until I forget." <laughs> you can't do that. Like, there's a time and a place for stuff like that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. It's. <laughs> You have to just find different ways of being like, hey, like you needed to do this job. Unfortunately, you did not do this job. You need to do this for next time. You got to stay on top of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I know you stopped、uh, martial arts for now. You're you don't do it anymore.、Yeah. Uh, why did you stop? Um, right now I stopped because I was too busy. <laughs>、uh, I stopped in 2018 because I just got so busy. But I would say like by that point anyway, I was just teaching. I wasn't. I wasn't even like fighting anymore. Like I hadn't fought properly in years at that point. Just injuries, I guess, and just lack of time and commitment. Yeah. Speaking of those injuries, what kind of injuries did you suffer from? Yeah. Um. So I have a slightly f- my left foot is slightly flat-footed. Now, any physiotherapist, any human kin major, immediately a flat foot indicates that it's more likely to roll. You're more likely to sprain that ankle, and that's what happened. It. My left ankle、uh, has been sprained so many times. Like I've rolled it ha- so many times, unfortunately. And it reached a point where that whole ligament—it's referred to as the peroneus ligament—got very. It got very weak. It got like overextended. A cyst developed in that ligament, and at one tournament, I blocked a kick, and suddenly it started hurting like really badly. So I ended up、uh, getting it checked out, and it subsequently required me getting surgery on it to put it back together. Jeez, how long was recovery? <laughs> so recovery was a while. Uh, I was probably in crutches for maybe three months, and then I was in an、uh, no, sorry, I was in crutches for six weeks, air cast for six weeks, and then physiotherapy for the next several months. Oh my gosh! And I would argue that only recently did I properly build the muscles back in it. Like this summer, I would say is when I like I would say I fully recovered. Yeah, it, it's kind of really interesting to hear like an injury affecting you for that long because like I've I've heard like sports stories about this too, or like when when people like you know like tear, like I think it's called the Achilles, like when people like tear that, like you can't get back in, and it will be so hard to like you know go back into your original form. So like I I、yeah. it's definitely do it's definitely really interesting to to hear about these experiences of like you know. People getting injured from sports and like how how much of a setback it, it is, not just for their sport life but also their personal life. Well, it also depends on how important what it what is injured. You、mm-hmm. know what I mean? The Achilles, the Achilles tendon is incredibly important for athletics because it allows for your springing ability. It allows for your explosiveness,、mm-hmm. right? It allows for your jumping ability. It's heavily involved in the actions like running. And if I tear that, I'm thereby changing the properties of the tendon、mm. once it heals,、yeah. right? So that's why it takes forever to get back from that injury. My injury, it was more so、uh, with a weaker ankle because of my flat foot、uh, and that surgery. I just what I should have done is rebuilt the muscles around that ankle, and that required running. That should have required more exercise. And unfortunately, I just didn't do that. Yeah, like Abby, just out of curiosity, you've gone through all of this, like you know, struggle from from when you got your injury, to, like you know, recovering till now. Do you think Sensei Abby will be back at it again sometime soon, or? No? <laughs> 
Uh, I don't think I'd be going back to it as a black belt if I do decide to. I do want to take up fighting in some capacity when I have time, but there's no way I'd enter it back uh, as a black belt. I'd rather yeah. enter it as a student and just try to learn it from there. So yeah, no, uh, fighting is very good cardio. It's mm. very good for the heart. And that's why uh, if I wanted to get back into it, that's what I do. That's that's a really good take on it. I should I should consider doing kick kick <laughs> kickboxing, but we'll see. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's a good self defense. Not just self defense. It's very good for it's very good for your fitness. It's very good for your heart. Let's talk a bit about your current research position at Carlton. How did you get that position, and what are you working on? Yeah, for sure. I think I talked about this a bit earlier regarding an independent research course mm -hmm. I took. So the independent research course got me into the lab. And then basically it was my opportunity to show my skills and prove my worth to my supervisor. And I was able to prove my worth to my supervisor enough to apply for a scholarship. And I was able to then receive the scholarship. I was very lucky to receive that. And that's given to some uh, uh, undergraduate researchers. And then I did research for that summer uh, relating to like functional proteomics in relation to cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually wondering about the job. You know, all jobs come with challenges. Um, I could speak on behalf of how, you know, in the industry of software engineering is, but I have zero clue as to the challenges for a research position um, within like university or a government. Can you explain like some of the challenges there is for like research, especially within the sciences? Uh, yeah, I would argue just challenges in general uh, when it comes to research. Uh, research can be very hard in the sense that if I devise an experiment and I plan it perfectly, there is still a distinct possibility that I might have missed one small detail or some condition would have been just off on that day that would result in a completely like null data. Like I cannot use that data. And that happens more often than you think. And therefore being a researcher, it requires extensive troubleshooting and extensive persistence. Yeah. And that's something that's something that is definitely built. If you don't already have it when becoming a researcher, you you get it. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, now that you, I'm guessing you work from home now, right? Because of the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. So what does a day-to-day -day, like as a researcher look like? Well, currently I'm working on my honors thesis, being a biochemistry honors. So I'm trying to graduate this year. Mm -hmm. So I need to submit an honors thesis, a project that I have come up with uh, and then got all the data for. Being the only undergraduate in the lab that I'm in, um... And because of the COVID pandemic, only three people are allowed in the lab at a time. Oh, wow. Yeah. And unfortunately, me being the only undergrad and there being several masters, PhD and postdoctorates in the lab, I don't get priority on lab time. So my project is very like bioinformatics. It's very uh, online. Me going through papers, finding a trend, and then maybe sometime in December, going in for like maybe a couple days, running some experiments, and then that's my project. So my day to day is literally just me surfing through papers. Yeah. How do you like surf through papers? Um, is it like journals or academic resources? Yeah, it's journal. It's journal articles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you do you also look through patents too? Or not? Um, what I'm doing doesn't really need a patent. Okay. You know. So I haven't really found a use for them yet. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Yeah. It's really interesting to hear, like, from a research perspective, because, like, me and Dorita, like, we have zero experience within, like, the research um, sphere of how things work. Because, like, we're used to, like, you know, your day to day office job and, like, mm -hmm. you go home and. Yeah. Research, I feel like research uh, requires a lot of patience. Yeah, it does require a lot of patience, a lot more. Yes. <laughs> It requires a lot of patience. Um, that summer, I worked. I uh, worked on that with that scholarship in the summer of 2019. And let me tell you, like I had to purify some proteins, and then I had to run assays with them um, to prove uh, a, a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, the assays that I was trying to do just would not work. Oh no. And it, it took a lot of troubleshooting. Yeah. Uh, even with protein purifications, that takes a lot of troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. What, what's protein it's purification? Life. Oh, would you like me to explain my project? Yes, please. <laughs> please. Would you really like me to? All right. Um, okay. Um, 
Yeah, let me break this down. Okay. I'm, I'm pulling out my headphones. Yes. High school I'm level. Yeah, okay. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Professor Abby's about to teach. Yeah, I think I explained this to you guys last week similarly like this. Um, so in every cell in your body, there's two meters worth of DNA. Now, two meters is a lot. That's the average wings, or no, that's not the average wingspan. That is more than the average wingspan of an average male. Like it's very long, you know? So how does two meters worth of DNA fit in hundreds of billions, if not trillions of cells in the human body? How? It's wrapped around. Yeah, gotta like condense it. Yeah, and it's it. gotta be compressed somehow, right? So I'm gonna show this with my headphones because this is, this is exactly what happens. So I have my headphones and these are not two meters long, but they are long nonetheless. And I need this to fit in my pocket. Now I can't just shove this straight into my pocket because that just doesn't work. So I have to fold, I have to fold it, right? So basically I am, what this is equivalent to is DNA is being folded around positively charged proteins called histones. Now, the reason that they are positively charged is because DNA is negatively charged. It's positive and negative. They attract, correct? So basically how tight the DNA is wrapped around these proteins dictates how much of it is expressed or how much information of it is outputted. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. Now, seeing as DNA is literally the blueprint for your entire body, there is a lot of regulation <laughs> that is involved in how tightly it is coiled. Now, I'm involved in one of the manners of how tightly it is coiled. Um, you guys ever heard of methane? It's a hydrocarbon, it's a gas. So methane is CH4, mm -hmm. uh, carbon with four hydrogens. Now, carbon with three hydrogens is called a methyl. Now, some proteins can take this methyl and put that on the protein, the positively charged protein, and that can change how much it's coiled, mm -hmm. right? But sometimes that can go haywire and that results in cancer. Mm -hmm. And my so job cool. is to find was to test inhibitors on that protein that puts methyl groups. Okay, I see. And how would you describe cancer? How would I describe cancer? Um, I describe it pretty much with the textbook definition for cancer. It's just uncontrolled replication of cells, right? I mean, cells are supposed to grow. They're supposed to replicate. Uh, I think your whole body turns over every like three weeks. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the exact number. But then if it isn't tightly regulated, then it rapidly grows and yeah. it creates these like amorphous masses that can be extremely dangerous to your survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Abby, I'm also just uh, wondering, would you consider like pursuing more research, like even after graduation on um, cancer research or is it going to be more so related to other things? Like where is it? Where's your head looking at for like, you know, future research like areas? Yeah, for sure. Um, I've always found genetics interesting and I've always found even proteomics. So that's protein stuff. Interesting. I also find it interesting genetics and proteomics, their affiliation with various diseases, right? Like cancer, like Alzheimer's, like diabetes, for example. I would love to be involved in something that is directly connecting those two. Mm. Maybe even in an unorthodox way. Maybe I'll come up with the unorthodox. <laughs> yeah, interesting. That's so exciting. To Maybe hear. you will. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it's, I don't know, there's so much out there to discover. So, yeah, I've always felt, okay, like whenever I think of like, you know, research or something like that, I always feel like we discovered everything. I don't think, I don't think there's anything else to discover, but like, you know, minds like yours, like you guys see, like, like I, I don't have that perception, but you guys have that perception of there's so much more out there that we don't know yet. And it's so interesting to, 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 to have that. Yeah. Well, a lot of that perception comes from just being trained that way. Right. It also just comes from being an optimist. <laughs> right. I mean, not every disease is curable, right? Not every body function is understood. Yeah, that is true. Why shouldn't it be, you know, mm -hmm. like so, the brain? Yeah. Brain is immensely complex. Yeah. So that would be an awesome field to go into as well. Like neurology and yeah. stuff. Yeah or psychiatry and associating that with genetics is even cool. Damn, mm -hmm. that is cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. It's gonna be so fascinating like in the upcoming years, especially with the growth in like biotech as well. Like we're gonna, like I, I see like there's gonna be way more discoveries and maybe Abby might be like one of the forefront leaders within those discoveries. Well, you never know. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, that'd be cool. Yeah, I mean, that'd be awesome if I could be able to get onto that wave yeah. and be able to make some awesome discoveries related to some disease.、Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it really is an awesome time for、uh, biochemistry, biotech. So if anyone who's listening is interested in that, hop on it, pursue it. Yeah, do it. <laughs> Other than you know research and your university experience, do you have any advice or tips for our audience here tonight? Last tip. Um, that I haven't given already. Hmm. I think I told you guys to be involved. Yeah.、Mm -hmm. Huge one. Get involved in any capacity、uh, possible. Uh, always stay positive. That's another one. Oh, that is true.、Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like life can be busy. Life can be. Life can bear down on you. But being able to have an optimistic perspective can drive you through it. Yeah. Right. Especially right now with the、yeah. pandemic, it's always good yeah, to be positive. Yeah, especially right now. Mm. All right. Thank you, Abby, for sharing your story with us. It was very interesting to hear you talk about the technical cool concepts. You're a really good teacher. You explained it very well. And of course, sharing your experience in university, it's always nice to hear about other students in other programs talk about Carlton and you know what their experience of campus is like. I find that very cool. And your cancer research, I think I think you explained really well how cancer relates to the research that you're doing, and I, I found it very easy to understand. So that was really cool. I'm glad. That means I did my job, <laughs> at least sort of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. If you'd like to hear more about Abby. You can check out his LinkedIn and his IG, all in the description below. And be sure to check out all our social media platforms at Capital Interns on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Check out our awesome things that we post day to day. If you're not already followed, make sure that you subscribe or follow us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts to be notified of all the latest episodes. The next guest is one of the most natural public speakers I've known from high school. And、I think that he could get an A plus by just like you know going up there and just starting to talk. He's just so great at like public speaking. He's currently studying communication and media studies at Carleton University and is currently doing an internship at Canaxis. Stay tuned as we delve into our guest's passions, experience, and personal life. Bye. Bye.